Ms. Davis? Here. Mr. Lane? Here. Dr. Elliott? Here. Mrs. Kreiling? Here. Mr. Markison? Here. Mr. Mormon? Here. Dr. Nemicus? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we're going to get right down to business. I'm going to skip the President's report this month and go right to the Superintendent's report. Mike? Okay, I'll begin on. with uh, Dr. Holland. And Drew is going to give his report first. All right. Hello. I'm Drew Arnson, Student Council Vice President. Uh, Trisha can't be here tonight. She has a badminton match. Um, so just updates from around the school since our last meeting. Uh, big topic last meeting was the walkout. Um, when is planned? Nothing unexpected happened, which is good. Um, that's how it was supposed to be. Um, the PSAT and SAT are happening tomorrow. Uh, seniors are looking forward to our day off. <laughs> Uh, the support staff luncheon is being put on by the Senior Student Council tomorrow afternoon, so that'll be fun. Um, spring sports, battling against the weather right now, have a lot, a lot of cancellations for a lot of things, but uh, hopefully it'll be getting warmer soon. Uh, prom invitations were sent out by the Junior Student Council, so everyone has received those. Uh, NHS applications are due soon for uh, juniors, and classes are starting to review for APs coming up sooner than you think. Um, the Wall of Fame ceremony is coming on April 20th. Um, there's some very exciting alumni who will be honored, so we're looking forward to that. Um, Student Council's partnership for a school for disabled students in Vietnam is going to get uh, kicked off next week, so uh, be on the lookout for more information on that. Um, this morning we talked to a mom from the APT to coordinate plans for the E-Day walk. Um, there are actually more food trucks coming than last year, so students should be excited about that. And uh, a lot of seniors heard back from colleges over spring break, so I would say a majority of seniors know where they're going uh, after they graduate or are down to one or two, uh, two or three schools, what they're deciding from. Okay, so I won't repeat too much. We have assessment day tomorrow at the high school. Um, our freshmen will start um, their test at 9 a.m. We're asking everyone to be there at 8.45 in, in their seats. And our 10th and 11th graders will start at 8 a.m. And we're asking for all of them to be there at 7.45 and seated. And so just a reminder, a couple years ago, um, we created a student growth model as outlined by PARA. And our growth model um, really actually helps us assess and understand student learning across the entire school. And because we have all grade levels, including our incoming eighth grade or incoming freshmen, current eighth graders assessed, we truly get a sense from eighth through twelfth grade um, an understanding of student growth as well as we're able to assess our overall academic program. And that information, similar to this year, will continue to be presented in our assessment um, report. And so um, I know that for the SAT is required for our students in terms of graduation, but the SAT suite actually supports the, the school's growth model. We have the Alumni Wall of Fame coming up um, April 20th. We are all excited about that. Um, we're encouraging all of our seniors to show up and um, be ready to um, cheer on our alumni and um, to enjoy the ceremony. The ceremony is in the RMA from 9.45 a.m. to 10.40 a.m. And it's a ceremony that's um, primarily for our senior class. Thank you. Okay, another part of the superintendent's report is uh, public recognition. So uh, Jimmy and uh, Corey and Laura and our students, come on up and tell us about uh, a really remarkable event uh, now in its fourth yeah, year. Fourth year. Yep. And uh, take it away. Yeah, we just finished uh, TEDx LPHS on April, what was the date? March 15th. March 15th. Uh, <laughs> it was a long time. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, we've had our fourth year. We had 16 speakers. Yeah, 17 speakers. 17 speakers. Four musical performances. Um, 140 participants. About 15 volunteers. And Can you use the mic? Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this is our fourth year doing the event, so we started this um, three years ago. Um, it's basically a way for students to share their big ideas, um, talk about you know what they're passionate about, and hopefully be the be the spark that 
you know, creates change. And we've had nearly 100,000, 100,000 views nearly. We're kind of approaching that total for our um, four years of TEDx LFHS talk. So the students and adults, Dr. Holland gave a talk this year. Um, they give talks, we record them, and then they, uh, they go up on the t official TEDx YouTube channel. Then Ted can also cherry pick uh, talks to kind of showcase. Um, Mary Beth Newar, who's one of our teachers, awesome teacher, awesome person, she gave a talk two years ago, and Ted, Ted actually tweets about her talk like every two months. Like every two months, like Mary Beth Newar will be tweeted about by Ted, which is just really, really, really cool. Um, so yeah, we have a couple students here, though, that could hopefully. Uh, uh, we have Ali Jackson, who is one of our speakers, one of our performers, and Ryan Eleveld, who is um, invaluable. He basically runs the entire event, um, and we cannot do it without him. So we'll let them kind of talk a little bit about you know, what it is and exactly what kind of drew them to it. Hi, um, I'm Ali Jackson, and um, I joined TEDx Club um, for the first time this year, but I was able to participate in the event last year. Um, and I did a musical act. I was able to perform two songs. And this year I really stepped out of my comfort zone and was able to give a talk on food waste in America. And it was just a really nice way um, for students to push themselves and present in front of their peers and spread ideas, you know, um, that are really important to them. So that's my. So before you run away from the microphone, well, we've got you there. Uh, so tell us about what you learned from this experience and what you overheard other students having gotten from it. Um, well, from this experience, I really learned um, important public speaking skills um, in terms of um, projecting and preparation. I was a little intimidated at in the beginning um, presenting because I was afraid of uh, that I wouldn't memorize my um, speech very well and that I would forget it while I was presenting and then I realized that practice makes perfect and you know it, it's not as long as you think it is and um, from my peers um, I was really inspired um, by the passion that my peers had and then the bravery um, and in addition to the teachers who presented I was kind of blown away with how um, willing they were to be vulnerable um, and I think that's what really made their talks powerful. So that's what I took away from it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ryan Eleveld. This is my second year helping out with TEDx. I mainly am a sound op and I do a little bit of sound design on the side. And probably my favorite part of TEDx is that it really lets us bring to bear the full resources our school has because unlike the musical or a play where we only get to use a specific portion of our resources. We get to drag out everything. This year, we bought a nice um, video switcher, so we live stream everything. We get to use an amazing Alan and Heath audio board that the school purchased a while back that is an analog mixer, as you can see in the picture. Um, and we occasionally also get to rent some wonderful bits of kit, like we rented two headset mics this year, which are much easier than using a standard lapel mic, um, which makes my job a lot easier because it, instead of taking 30 seconds to switch, it takes two. Um, honestly, it's enjoyable because we get to work with so many different people. We get to work with new media, of course. There's so many wonderful speakers who have covered an amazing variety of topics, everything from how the influenza virus spreads to what it's like to build your own guitar in class and how that can apply to learning in general and a different style of learning. So Ryan, you're also uh, one of the people behind the curtain uh, for the talent show as well, right? So there's one of the things that strikes everybody every year about the talent show, in addition to the students on stage, is the production value uh, that is unbelievably good for uh, everybody is astonished by that at high school. So uh, tell us a little bit, take us behind the curtain a little bit about some of the stuff that uh, that you learned over the past year because you've been really involved and how that shows up in, in quality on the stage here. Honestly, I think we're all very impressed by how well Talent Show comes out. It's very stressful initially, but by the end, everything just seems to come together. One of the big things with Talent Show is there's a lot more organization work involved where we have to plot out, okay, this is who's moving which things. and this happens at this time, we might have to do a change when the lights are completely out or it might be during a video, things like that. And that's especially helped with TEDx um, 
because again, we have to plan out how we're doing these changes. This year we ended up using two different mics um, for both speakers, so that allowed us to alternate which mic was being worn by each speaker, so we'd have an even speaker and an odd speaker, and we changed out mics. And this is really where TEDx wraps back around into the rest of the theater program in general um, and performing arts. TEDx, because we have a little bit more time comparatively to prepare and it's a little bit more experimental, we get to test out all sorts of different new things. Like, for example, this year I tested out a new miking setup. Um, in addition to the head mics, we had a bit of reinforcement and we made more of a surround sound mix in comparison to previous years where we've only had a uh, normal left-right sound mix. Uh, how much risk is involved for you in trying stuff out and it doesn't work and boy, I'm glad I did it, but in this, and this is what I learned. It's always a learning experience, um, as I'm sure Dr. Holland and a couple of other people remember. We had these speakers, I don't think you could see them in the pictures, but speakers would walk right past them every time they entered and exited the stage. And one of the issues is that if I don't cut the mic fast enough, then it'll feed back in that awful, awful noise. It's, it's, it's traumatizing, to say the least, for a sound <laughs> Um And while we theoretically could have moved the speakers or say something like that, we decided it was worth the risk to have them there, in part because it kept them more out of sight and it was a better view overall, but also because positioning-wise, it would provide a more full coverage of the audience. Did anybody get traumatized? Uh, <laughs> much better this year. <laughs> Ryan, is audio your main interest, audio and sound? Your um, audio, stage design, videography, lights. <laughs> I do a little bit of everything before I entered high school. My main, um, I was with another theater group and I helped out there and the main thing I did was run sound. It was a very small program to the point where we didn't even have a light board. Um, <laughs> But, so audio is my first love. I've tried to diversify. Um, lighting this winter went okay, but I think I'll stick with sound. <laughs> Incredibly valuable. Most people, younger people want to become Quentin Tarantino, so sound editing is uh, incredibly valuable. There aren't enough good ones. Most of them are like, that's why I was curious, are uh, like washed out musicians. Oh. <laughs> Guys that couldn't make it, uh, no, they really couldn't make it as uh, Mick Jagger. <laughs> So it's, inter it's good that you're doing it as a young age. I mean, you're, you're going to become incredibly valuable very quickly. So stick with it. Thank you. Yeah, um, I should also say, kind of like bridging off of what Ryan said, our sound was the best it had ever been. Um, and our video editing was the easiest and fastest it's ever been. I want to publicly recognize um, the APT and the foundation for generously granting us all this wonderful equipment. Um, just to kind of put it into perspective, it usually takes about three months to edit these videos together because uh, there's two different feeds, there's all these things going on. We got it done in one week this year, and we think that really shows. It's really important to get that out as quickly as possible so all our student speakers get the recognition that they deserve and kind of keep the momentum up. So between the new equipment and like Ryan, um, it's honestly the best it's ever been. I also just want to add, um, it's an honor for our school to be a TED school and our ed techs go to um, the training and they keep a tight partnership with TED. And so I want to thank you for all of your work. Also, between the ed techs and the students, they're the most encouraging um, people on the planet. The students were very supportive and encouraging of me and others, and the ed techs literally provided moral support for all of us along the entire way. Just having them present made it a lot easier. Any feedback, any time of night, um, they've just been truly supportive and hands-on. Yeah, and, and that starts uh, with the leadership. All that positive energy, it is totally contagious, and it's like a love fest in there. So uh, it's amazing that this happens at our school. I'm, I'm struck by it every year, and it's live stream. So grandparents or friends around the world are able to watch this. So this is the best part of our meeting, you guys. So thank you, uh, Laura, Corey. Thank you. Jimmy. Yep, thank you.
So this is the time of year when uh, students hear back about their uh, college admissions and uh, from time to time, uh, one year or another, uh, things sort of flare up in the community about, hey, there's a level of anxiety about uh, I, I didn't, my student didn't get into the, the school that he or she hoped to and uh, why is this happening and how do we compare to other schools and so I want to uh, speak to that briefly. Uh, if I can figure out how to advance this. So, uh, a few years ago, I took a look at our, uh, some of our peers. There's one peer that publishes all of the data on their students' uh, applications, admissions, and then later attendance. And this is uh, how Stevenson stacks up. They put all this stuff out on the web. So there are top five schools, uh, all big schools, the most popular ones that, uh, that uh, their students attend. And you'll see a significant amount of overlap here when you look at our five. So Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, uh, ISU, and Wisconsin. And I would say uh, right now if we were to update this data, Missouri would probably not be on there anymore. It would probably have been replaced by um, uh, Iowa, I would guess. But we will have to update this and find out. So I heard about this conversation in the community. Uh, just today, and so uh, this is uh, the latest information that I was able to grab today. So I also went back over seven years and looked at uh, selective, highly, highly selective enrollment schools, because those are the ones that we tend to hear about, and it's how do we stack up? And uh, the difference in the size of the schools obviously has, uh, uh, plays a role here. Also the number of students who've applied and accepted, you can go pretty deeply into the, the analytics of this, but what I looked at is uh, where, uh, how many students were accepted. And uh, you can see uh, for some of the Ivies, uh, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, uh, were relatively close um, when you do the math on those two, uh, but not as many. Uh, students who were admitted on those three, but when you look at Cornell, relative to the size differential, uh, we have vastly more students who are admitted to Cornell and Stevenson for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt, but, but going forward, if you're going to revisit the data, um, one of the things that confounds me is that people don't count uh, the athletic commitment with the automatic in with early action decision. Yeah but it comes out on the back end. So that would be helpful, I think, sometimes to the community to understand who's getting in without that in. Yeah, I don't have. As a, as a unique in, I mean, that's, not, that's a done deal if you get recruited yep. sophomore year and you sign the letter. Yeah. So, but I think that would be helpful, I think, to understand how. Yeah, the, the Stevenson does not report that in any way, and, and we don't either. One of the things that uh, is very much the case in schools like Lake Forest is that uh, we're going to have at a given highly selective school, they're going to admit one, perhaps two students from our school. And if that happens to be a student with an athletic scholarship, that's your student for the year. Well, Wayland has a sign-in day to a degree or, or some fee, so there's probably a way to extrapolate back and understand who's getting in without the end. Right. Yeah. Who's getting in just from the application. Interesting point. One of the key differences between students from Lake Forest and Stevenson is Williams and Amherst, those are known as the Little Ivies, and those are the most selective of the uh, non-Ivies. They're also small, they're under 2,000 students, and they have very few students that apply uh, there. Uh, it's uh, one of the things when you go to a uh, high school with over 4,000 students, you can actually take a step back in terms of the type of facilities that you have. If you go to one of these little schools and if you have visited them, you'll see that Stevenson's physical plant is really astonishing compared to uh, even uh, uh, many of the private colleges. I've been on the campus of both of these and I think uh, Stevenson holds, uh, holds up very, very well compared to either of them. Uh, so we show up uh, very differently because uh, Relatively speaking, Williams and Amherst are around the same size or larger uh, compared to our school. So there are some things that have changed, and this is part of uh, the conversation in the community. Uh, a number of factors that have changed uh, since 
2014 when I gathered this data and now, and it just continues to go. Uh, one is the common app. So st uh, students are applying uh, more than ever to more places than ever, and it's easier than it's ever been. Uh, if you think of how many colleges that you applied to, the answer for uh, this age group is probably one or two. Um, and for your kids, it's probably uh, many students are over 10 right now. Uh, the most we had a few years ago, I think, was 39. Uh, another factor is the, whether it's, or not students are geographical minorities or non-minorities. So if you are all from the North Shore and you're applying to all the same highly selective schools, uh, that works as a very distinct disadvantage for our students. Also, when you factor in uh, how many uh, of the students that are admitted are athletes, so the overall uh, intake of students, uh, children of major donors, international kids, legacies, um, promising students, whether they're low income or minority, and they're also looking for kids from a wide range of backgrounds. Uh, that takes up about two-thirds of the most selective schools available slots. Vanderbilt's acceptance rate this year, for example, is down to 7.3 percent, and that is down Last time I saw it was uh, they were in double digits and they've dropped uh, obviously well below that. They're middle 50 percent, so uh, the middle 50 percent of their group is a 33 and the tops of the 75th percentile would be a student with a 35. Um, that is unbelievably rarefied air and uh, that's the kid at the 75th percentile. So the result of all this is kids are applying uh, more and more uh, to more places and they're competing for uh, what's already a small slice of the pie. We had an author in speaking this year, she's a dean of Stanford and uh, she worked with freshmen there and a couple things that she pointed out. One is that uh, schools have a vested interest in getting as many students to apply as possible because it makes them look very good whether they have a likelihood of being admitted or not. And then uh, also uh, the, the, the reality, she was at Stanford, the reality is despite what they say about accepting well-rounded students and all the happy talk around that, the reality is they're going to admit the student that takes the, a, the eight AP classes in their senior year or some ridiculous thing like that. Um, and this is something that's been going on uh, for some time. Uh, she adds, as, as a note, and we've got a number of our students here with us, uh, I've heard from our students, and she said it over and over, man, don't ask your kids uh, where, let them tell you. Don't ask them where they're going um, because uh, it's really awkward, really, really awkward for them. Um, the benefit, there are huge benefits and challenges to going to a great high school in Lake, Lake Forest is absolutely a great high school on the North Shore of Chicago. Uh, the beginning of that is what's known as uh, relative deprivation. Um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell this is incredibly robust. No matter where you happen to be, you create your perception of the world based on who's around you. One of the things with this, I talk to parent groups about this, how many people in the nation have college degrees? What percentage of the American populace has a college degree? And in a town like this, the estimates are typically 70 or 80 percent, something like that. It's below 30 percent nationally. But in this town, everybody's got a degree, or virtually everybody. And so um, here it is very easy to feel inferior and that shows up in a bunch of different ways. Our kids, generally speaking, don't think they stack up all that well until they leave. And after they leave, they realize that they write better, they are stronger in math, they are, uh, are incredible presentation skills, and on and on. Uh, so uh, our average ACT is north of 27 right now. Uh, the national average is uh, hugely below that. So. Uh, our students stack up amazingly well um, across the board. Uh, one of the things that Gladwell also points out is that it really, really matters uh, where you go 
uh, and uh, if you are a big fish in a small pond, all of the advantages of, of that institution accrue to you. And it's really, really tough to be on the bottom of the hierarchy. So if you got into that stretch school and you're just barely hanging on, uh, it gets really, really tough. And he looked at uh, students in STEM, math, and science, and he said it doesn't matter. Any college that you go to, the kids who are on the top, they get degrees, and the students that are on the bottom, they don't. And the kids that are in the middle, it's about a 50-50 proposition. So it doesn't matter whether you look at uh, Eastern Kentucky or Harvard, they do the same thing. So what advantages do our kids have uh, from being in such a great school? Uh, they're super well prepared in all of their core areas. They also have a huge number of opportunities to be involved curricularly, co-curricularly, uh, just like with the TEDx. Uh, for some of the students, that means uh, going to a big school is a great thing and they find a sense of place uh, in their fraternity or their sorority, uh, but there are other ways that uh, our students can really benefit that, in my opinion, not enough of them take seriously. And that is looking for the opportunity for personalization where they can differentiate the students or an opportunity to be a big fish in a small pond. Uh, these places have amazing alumni networks and also, very importantly, when college now, if you go to a highly selective school, you'll get zero money from them, and it will be sixty-five to seventy thousand dollars, not including travel. Uh, scholarships for our kids—they are dying to give our kids scholarship money at tons of places. And uh, at least uh, two of the students that are with us here today are students that are recipients of that kind of scholarship money at the very kinds of places that I'm talking about. So the upshot of this is our kids have an incredibly disproportionate advantage at a smaller school or in an honors college, at a larger uh, state college, um, or in places where kids don't apply that much. If they're all going to the, all applying to the same places, uh, they're not going to admit, no matter how fantastic our students are, they're going to have a limited number of students that are going there. So look at where kids are going. Uh, small schools, honors colleges, and schools in the northeast are, and northwest are largely overlooked. A lot of thing, I don't, a lot of parents think that they can't afford to send their kid to a private school. There's almost no such thing as uh, full price anymore unless you're going to one of the most selective schools in the nation. They will offer anywhere from uh, 20 to 40 percent scholarship, making it less expensive than it is to go to U of I. Also, the lack of name brand recognition, and this is where asking kids where they go, uh, parents create an amazing amount of pressure on their kids by talking about where their kids are applying. My advice to kids is, and parents, don't tell anybody anything. Not your GPA, not your ACT score, not where you're applying or where you've been admitted to. You tell them one thing and one thing only. This is where I'm going and it's a great place for me. That's it. That takes all the pressure off. So uh, finding just the right place for, for your kid, that is a, a huge opportunity in all of the selective school uh, press is if the search is to find just the right place for your kid, irrespective of where it is, it can even be in a foreign country. We have kids each year that go to England, sometimes they go to Canada. Find just the right place for you and double down on that and you will be a happier person. There are huge consequences for being at the bottom of a hierarchy and correspondingly huge advantages for being at, at the top of the hierarchy. So if you are in the Honors College at uh, Seton Hall University or if you're in a specialized program at a place like that, all of the institutional uh, wherewithal is directed at those top students. That's what every college does. If you take a six or seven year view of this and you save your money for graduate school, let somebody else pay for your undergrad, and increasingly the graduate degree is what really, really winds up being the differentiator. And class rank makes a difference on where you get in and what kind of aid you get. So uh, the three things that make a difference in graduate school are class rank, GPA, and your test scores. And you're more likely to be uh, more highly placed if you are 
um, at a place where you have really, really thrived. So uh, that is uh, the, the, the message that uh, I'd like to send our kids and our parents about what college admissions looks like right now. Thank you. Uh, related to one of those bullets on one of your slides, what do we do, maybe this is a question for you, Shayla, to make sure kids know they, don't, they shouldn't take the 8 AP classes, and this is a bubble. I mean, this is a uh, unfair look at what they're going to see in college. <laughs> that they shouldn't take eight AP classes? <laughs> and, yeah, it, it just when you're comparing yourself to Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, Nola, that that's not a realistic look at the world. Um, yeah, I, I can speak that. I mean, when you go to the uh, Illinois conference for school board members, it's amazing to be in a room with school board members who work in schools uh, or, or are on, uh, excuse me, that are on boards of schools that do not have an AP class. And if they do, they may have an online AP class. In communities like this, there is an extraordinary amount of pressure that is not necessarily generated by the parents. Frequently, it's the lunch table. Where it's where the toughest uh, questions what are asked. Do? What do you do? Ah, I, I think some of the stuff that uh, it it has to do with speaking openly and plainly about it. That's one of the reasons that Drew Lithcott Hames came in uh, with our counselors. I think they're always in a really tough position because they have ambitious ambitious kids um, and ambitious parents that have expectations, and there's this arms race that's going on. Um, I think they're in probably the toughest position, but they're always trying to moderate, in my experience, trying to moderate um, what looks like a well-balanced lifestyle. But, uh, Shelley, you might have some other things to add to that. Thanks. <laughs> so um, I, we encourage, we're encouraging students to think about fit. Um, oftentimes I talk with classes of students, actually, and we talk about their interests and things like that. And there is a pressure to um, consider the top 50 um, colleges, whether they uh, really want to go there or not. And when we talk about some of their experiences, sometimes there's not, there's less of a conversation around fit and more around um, the prestige connected to the college. And I understand the benefits of that as well. But um, absent fit, many students will choose a school and not be happy um, or fulfilled and start looking elsewhere. And so when we have the conversations here and we have the reports around how our kids are finishing, how many students end up leaving a school and going to another, that connects with that. Um, I also think that we need to continue to educate the entire school community on the landscape. Um, similar to what was just shared, um, Colleges are enrolling less. Um, I've been looking over the messages our college counselors have received from all these universities. A common theme is that um, they're not accepting as many students, and they are looking for um, students with well-rounded experiences or something that sets them apart as well. And so while we try to encourage students to think about um, their entire time in high school and ways to stretch themselves. Um, part of this is also talking to students about um, being who you are and being comfortable with that and speaking to that in the application process. Um, and I think that's important. I also, um, I know there's a lot of pressure and that's real and everyone feels it. Um, but I think the more we can um, educate the school community as well as keep our pulse on things and make sure that our academic offerings and program is in alignment um, or considers that trajectory. While I would love to create our own school that's absent any outside pressure, the, real, the reality of it is we are responsible for, for preparing our kids for whatever they want to do. And so we have an obligation to, to make sure that there's a level of alignment while also encouraging our students to be authentic and to um, consider what they want to do and find a school or an experience that is a, a good fit for them after they leave us. So, Risha, I'll, I'll say having survived two and, and a third on the horizon, um, I think one of the pieces that parents need to recognize, like any other uh, piece of the world, you look at 
all the major league teams in expansion, the concept that the prestige schools are only 10 has to be a concept that has to be eliminated. And the prestige schools should probably be the top 25, and we shouldn't talk about the top 50, but really the top 100, and that it's not a failure if you're not in the top 10, because that's that the amount in the pool of applicants has increased exponentially, and the admitted students hasn't. And so it, it's naturally, it's a flawed idea that there's only one Harvard, and that's that if you're not there, you're a failure. And I think a lot of parents get hung up on well, those are the 10 schools when I was younger, and now the top 10 should be a top 25 and a top 100. Yeah, I, uh, as a parent of three graduates, I can attest to the fact that Lake Forest prepares them very well. There's no question that they have excellent academic grounding. And, um, but I did want to pick up on the one Gladwell quote about the huge consequences of being at the bottom of the hierarchy. And um, I appreciate how important that is in terms of finding the right fit for college, but we need to apply that to Lake Forest High School and think about students who may feel at the bottom of the hierarchy at Lake Forest High School. And we do not want those terrible consequences to leave our building on graduation. Yeah, I couldn't possibly agree more. I, I think uh, it, it's one of the things that I hear repeatedly from students is that, and it's a hard thing, is like um, uh, one of my friends, uh, uh, their uh, son was talking about, you know, I only have A, and it was a, a, a nationally leading ACT score, I only have, and that's a, a very common way for kids to, to feel until they leave, or um, it's a really, really hard community to be a nationally average or a nationally below average kid. And these, every student deserves to be challenged and stimulated and offered um, as many opportunities as possible. And, and uh, it's very easy to uh, overlook all the students in, in, uh, in favor of some um, and completely agree. Yeah, it's one final thing. Uh, this is not a conversation that is unique among parents to Lake Forest. I also texted a couple of my regional colleagues here, and uh, one of the comments was, yeah, our school had a really tough year at Michigan this year. I uh, had a really hard time getting kids admitted, and I'm very happy to have one of our students here uh, with us that uh, was got a, got a favorable acceptance there and is talking about it publicly, so I'm not outing anybody, so happy to hear that. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to address the board? Good evening. My name is Mark Stern. I'm a taxpayer of this district. I'm here tonight to demand that this board discharge its duty to hold Superintendent Simic accountable for his failure to operate the district in accordance with board policies. Last month, the superintendent permitted students to skip class to engage in partisan demonstrations. It has also been reported that in direct violation of the closed campus policy, at least nine students left campus for an extended time during the school day. True civil disobedience, not the fake North Shore variety, has consequences. The student handbook states that all absences are documented and communicated. First, not permissible absences result in progress cards sent to parent and student. Has this been done? There is no policy-based governance if the administration can ignore policies with impunity. The purpose of this disruption is irrelevant. Who's in charge, the board or teenagers? If on April 20th, also known as 420, 100 kids announce a walkout to demand action to legalize weed, which 68% of Cook County just voted in favor of doing, who are you to stop them? Once you open the door, you cannot engage in viewpoint-based discrimination. Let's just schedule a free period every week for the cause celebra of the moment. Taking an hour of recess in the middle of the school day is not exactly a profile in courage either. When kids turn up for an event at 7 a.m. during spring break, then we'll know they're committed. The silent majority of students suffered from this. Their right to attend class was denied by the actions of the minority, abetted by pusillanimous administrators. If anything was learned, it is that a loud group can ignore the rules and disrupt the education of their peers 
the exact opposite of what we should teach our children about becoming responsible and respectful citizens in a free society. And Superintendent, perhaps that's why Mizzou is no longer on the top list for exactly that reason. Thank you. So I'll, I'll skip right to uh, the committee reports. Education committee, please. Anything since last month? We have not met. Our next meeting is April 17th. Finance and ops. David? Uh, we have a meeting this coming uh, 16th. Uh, so we have yet to meet and will shortly. Thank you. Uh, policy, Diana and Ted? Uh, we met this morning and not a whole lot to report. Result is pretty straightforward. Nothing on, I don't see any new stuff. So next month, next month we'll have some new policies. Okay, cool. All right, Sally, uh, liaison report, Ed Red. I have several things. <laughs> okay. So the, uh, on March 14th, uh, doc, uh, Mr. Simic and I, I just promoted you, uh, attended the Illinois Association of School Boards Lake Division's spring meeting, and there were two things that were talked about there that I'd like to share with the board. The first is that Roger Eddy, who's the current uh, executive director um, I, of IASB, although he is, has announced his retirement, reported that uh, Governor Rahner had met with legislators in Illinois on March 13th to discuss a package of school safety legislative initiatives that we are likely to see uh, wending their way with proposed legislation in the upcoming session. IASB advised its membership to think about um, the importance of maintaining local controls in terms of any proposals that are made in relation to that. I don't have any more information than that, but No, it wasn't at all clear, and they haven't been uh, introduced yet. They go back into session next week, though, now that the primaries are over, and I think that we will start to see some of that proposed legislation. Um, but I thought it was interesting to talk about um, the impact on local school districts having control over how they would enact them, and that was the one thing they told us to watch out for. The second thing um, was that the featured speaker was Dr. David Schuler, who is the superintendent of uh, School District 214 in Illinois. It's the second largest school district. Um, it encompasses Buffalo Grove, Wheeling. He was just named the high school district, uh, I'm sorry, the 2018 Illinois Superintendent of the Year by the Illinois Association of School Administrators. And he is one of the founders, um, along with uh, folks from the uh, School Superintendents Association, of an organization called Redefining Ready. Um, their website is redefiningready. Hmm, I'm going to say org. Redefiningready.org. Um, their mission is to talk about research-based metrics to define and assess students for college readiness, career readiness, and life readiness. And I liked that. I liked that third edition of life readiness there. They started out um, taking issue with uh, the college and career readiness scores that were reported by the standardized test makers. And they talked about the phenomenon when Park was first introduced um, of all of a sudden finding very dismal numbers um, of students who were deemed college and career ready and uh, finding that just as we track our students' um, performance at four and five years out, the number of students who were going on to uh, achieve um, college degrees didn't match with the dismal numbers that they had been um, predicted. So I am going to share with all of you a single page from their college and career readiness indicators um, material, all of which is publicly available on their website. As we are entering into the exercise to create our own dashboard, and uh, Mr. Simic had reported on that a couple of board meetings ago, I thought there were some interesting metrics that we ought to be looking, about, looking at in terms of data that was of interest to us. I want to be super careful that I am not an expert in this area. There are too many people in the room that are, including Dr. Holland um, and Mr. Simic, so I am not the right person to speak to this in detail, but I hope that we will talk about this more perhaps in the Ed Committee. 
there were some very interesting things. Um, it's a terrific uh, presentation, and one of the things that IASB is doing is talking about putting um, past presentations online um, in a webinar format. I would love for us to be able to watch it as a board. It's maybe 15 or 20 minutes long. But there were lots of cool um, big data metrics that are, I think are worth consideration, one of which um, that, that play out, right, as they see the, the students passing through and then their, their uh, performance in um, college. They talked, he talked, for, of course, about the importance of attending AP classes. We've heard that many times from um, our administration. And the fact that just being in an AP class can have phenomenal benefits, whether or not you even take um, the AP test or how you score on it. There was a lot of emphasis on the benefit of dual enrollment, which is something I know that we are um, looking actively at. He had one um, interesting fact. Students are statistically significantly more likely to participate persist to a second semester of college and earn a higher college GPA if they have, um, if they've had the opportunity to take even one dual enrollment class while they're in high school. He talked about the metrics around attendance, which is something that Dr. Holland has um, been doing a lot to bring us um, within not only the Illinois standards, but also to link it through um, our record keeping to ensure that our students are attending because we know that that, that breeds success as well. Um, he talked also about uh, the benefits of using community services um, requirements to fulfill class requirements. They tended to enhance the odds of college graduation by up to 22%. I thought those were really interesting metrics. Again, I'm not the expert, but I thought those were interesting things that were worth pursuing. The last thing he said, <laughs> I can see Dr. Holland, okay. The last thing he said is that they are um, uh, considering asking any vendor who awards any contract to do work in the district to offer internships to their students, which I also thought was an interesting, was an interesting um, notion that we might want to pursue. I'm ready to talk about the federal legislative stuff, so I'll stop here because you have stuff you want to say. So we are ahead of this. Um, our entire PLP, and I'll be presenting on that at the end of the year, is totally aligned with this work. I keep my finger on the pulse of all this. And um, you'll see volunteer service, you'll see attendance, you'll see um, an alignment between um, the courses that our kids have taken, um, as well as their involvement in extracurriculars, which is in there, dual credit opportunities. Our whole dashboard is already based on all of these. So we have been at the forefront of creating a system, a systemic way of collecting this information and our dashboard is based off of all of, every, literally everything that you mentioned. So I just wanted to share that because um, we've talked about in the last two years in our strategic plan, life readiness, which connects to um, our SEL work and our executive functioning work as well. I'm not at all surprised that you're on top yeah. of it. That's great. Um, I felt like many of the things he had talked about were things that we have heard about in the Ed Committee. I just, I found it very inspiring, so I'm thrilled to hear that we're gonna hear more about it. Um, briefly, federal legislative. Um, on March 23rd, President Trump signed the final fiscal year 18 budget into law. It provided a $2.6 billion increase to the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, there had been expectations that education funding would be cut in this fiscal year, so um, any level of funding that even remained flat would be considered a win. Um, our district budget, I believe, takes in about 643000 this year in restricted restricted grants from the federal government, and at least we can expect to continue to be paid. Is that fair to say? <laughs> fair enough. Last point. Um, the state of Illinois has finally started uh, the payment process for the additional 300 million plus to schools that were deemed um, to have inadequate funding. We were, uh, the, all of the schools in the state of Illinois have now been given their adequacy targets and what percentage of that they are currently funded at and we are assigned to tiers for eligibility for the new funding. As completely anticipated, we are in tier four, which puts us at the bottom of the list in terms of getting um, the, the new state uh, funding, although we are gonna get something like $2,000, which is exciting. Um, more. $2,000 more, I'm sorry, not just only $2,000. Um, if you are interested, and you probably aren't, um, I did print everybody, so if you're at all, yeah, Tom's not interested, I'll pass it down. You can see where everybody else fell, the end. I'm assuming that North Shore is a lot of tier four. 
Yeah, there was a lot of tier fours, yeah. Most, yeah, I think all the north suburban, north shore districts are tier four. But I, I will say, for what it's worth, what makes it kind of interesting reading is um, how, how underfunded um, some, some districts are. It's, it's painful, some of the reading. Okay, uh, Diana, anything to report on APT Foundation? Um, just really quickly, um, the foundation, we had, they had a meeting on March 21st, and their big news is they're celebrating Educational Excellence Luncheon is coming up on Wednesday, April 18th at Exmoor Country Club. Um, kind of some new things for them this year. I think they've followed your lead, Mike. They are having teacher and student speakers from the art department and the business incubator program come. It's kind of the highlighted feature of the, the luncheon. They have cocktail reception music being performed by Swing Sonata's Jazz, Jazz Ensemble, which is from our, our high school, um, talented high school musicians. And they have a balloon pop fundraiser, which unlike a raffle, everybody wins. So lots of good prizes. Apparently it's like a number and then you go claim whatever it is, but you're guaranteed something. Um, last thing, they have 60 plus silent auction items, including prom packages, parking, and student artwork. I'm kind of excited about that one. Um, the APT meeting was April 4th, um, not to duplicate what Drew and Dr. Holland covered. Prom is coming up, and if any parent out there wants to donate to prop Project Safe Prom, which is how the buses get paid for, they would love to take your money. Um, there's lots and lots of buses that pull out of that parking lot to take the kids to the prom and bring them back safely. So donations are appreciated. Um, and then the last thing, Dr. Sasson just kind of gave the board an update about all the wonderful things he's been doing. Um, they reviewed food allergies and anaphylactic procedures and created a handbook. I feel very good about that. And he was just talking about next year's registration and how the classes are filling and the comprehensive approach that the counselors were taking instead of just check, check, check. So. It was all really good news, and there was no boosters meeting in March, so we'll have more to report from the April meeting. Thank you. Uh, Ted, anything on NSSED? Uh, we, NSSED, we have not met since our last meeting. However, I did just get an email saying, uh, for those who haven't come with me to a meeting, um, there are three main buildings on the uh, Highland Park campus. And the second largest building is what's considered the Rubloff building. It used to be uh, United Cerebral Palsy's building. Um, we've been in negotiations for years about possibly taking it over. In the meantime, we've been uh, renting or leasing the building and just received word that um, apparently we've um, reached terms where we will be buying the building. Which, it's good for us because we're buying it for a lot less than we lease it for over the uh, long term. Um, I'll have more to report Wednesday. And if you want to get the information when I get it, you can come with me. Of course, nobody's taken me up on that. Uh, secondly, um, on May 19th, we have our uh, foundation 5K. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Nemicus and Dr. Blom from uh, Illinois Bone and Joint. They're our title sponsor uh, for the event with a very generous uh, donation. So if you want to get out and get some fresh air and go running on Saturday morning, May 19th, come on out and join us. Thank you for warm up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Highland Park at the campus. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up are the action item part of, my, of the agenda. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody, please stop me. I'm going to ask for a motion in a second and then leave some time for questions in the middle. Please, anybody, if I don't do that, stop me and correct me um, so we have time for questions or discussion in the middle. Okay, so a first up is approval of an elevator renovation bid in the amount of $88,731. May I have a motion to approve the elevator renovation bid? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the elevator renovation bid in the amount of $88,731. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, questions? Discussion? Anything? There was just one bid. Um, yes, indeed, there was just one bid. It was publicly put on notice that we were accepting bids. Um, I did question and ask why. 
Um, my understanding is this is a very small job in the elevator world, as it is an elevator that is, um, it's, a, it's not a bank of elevators, and it's only a few floors. So um, generally speaking, it isn't the most desired. The current, um, the submitted bidder is actually the company that we use for our service on the elevator, so they're most familiar with the project most likely as well. It's a complicated modernization. The spec itself was, for the project, was over 300 pages. A little bit of an idea about what do you mean by modernization? Is it a safety issue? Is it so the uh, elevator itself is, is a little over 30 years old. So we continually, obviously we have inspected. There's a state inspector for elevators as well as the inspections that we do. Um, we try to be more preventative than reactive. So when you kind of look at all of your equipment, uh, what useful life may or may not be, what have you been replacing, what parts are becoming difficult to get, um, this was placed on our horizon a, a few years back knowing that eventually we were going to need to update those panels, so it's the electrical panels and the, uh, um, the accompanying engineering that goes with that. Then also, uh, if you read the memo, we're going to need to do a few other things that was pointed out by the state inspector as well. Since we are making changes to the area, we also had to bring other, air, other pieces of that area up to code. So for example, we needed to move the sub pump out of that uh, engineering room into a different room. We needed to add an exhaust fan because there's going to be a heat issue uh, with those panels. So there are a few other things that we also had to add. But generally speaking, being more preventative than reactive when you know that you have equipment that's, well, in this, in this case, probably past its useful life, um, but we were able to get it this far. One, like, one last question. How many people use the elevator? Like, do you have round numbers? I do not, that'd be more of a, I'm not taking a tally or a, a survey. Um, it is the main elevator when you walk into the high school to the left, just off the main entrance. I had sent something, uh, uh, thinking it was the one in the commons, and uh, the one that, uh, uh, where you walk straight in the front door and it's on the left, uh, the stuff that I see going up and down that, a lot of that is the tech stuff because tech is down there. There's a lot of, it's like a freight elevator almost. There's really, only, there's two elevators in the high school. There's the one located just off the main entrance and then there's one down, and that may be what you're calling comp the commons, but it's the lunchroom. Those are the two elevators for the building. So the total cost though with all that other stuff, the sump pump and the heat load, it's 110,000? Is that what? 110 was the original budget. I'm. The actual project cost right now is estimated at 129,000. We're going to try to do some of that in-house, um, some of the wiring, um, fire door, um, those type of things listed at the bottom. Uh, maybe farm out some of the small jobs. I did leave in a construction contingency, so that will be probably the difference if we're unable to do it in-house and we need to go get expertise that we don't have. If we're able to do it in-house, I don't anticipate using the contingency, um, so that money would just be. And also, I see uh, Perkins and Will, once again, it, it's the uh, um, architecture of note. Uh, how much are they getting? I don't have the break. It was a 19,000 fee, but most of that is to engineering for that, that spec. But I do have the breakdown if you want to. I could shoot it to you at a, at a later point. But I asked the breakdown between architect and engineering. But the majority okay. is for engineering. So why has this been, I mean, I know it's been on our list for a couple, three years. Why has it always been pushed and why? Well, it was pushed once. It came on the list in 2015-16, and I think at the time um, that it was more of an immediate concern, um, we were able to make some tweaks to it. So as with any other piece, if we feel we can get a few more years out of it, we'll, we'll push it down. Um, I would be hesitant to continue to do that. It's only a, a matter of time, um, I think, before we become reactive and not preventative. So we did move it from 16 to 18. It's been sitting at 18 for the last, fiscal year 18 for the last two years. Um, technically now this will be a fiscal year 19 project because it won't conclude until probably August. And Jen, what's the, life, what's the lifespan of this? I, I may have missed that. Uh, of the new, of uh, the modernized one, because all the components, all the, I mean, we're not replacing the elevator. Um, the piece but the presumption is we're going to do this and then we're not going to have to look at the elevator for 20 years? Well, at for least long after I'm gone. I'm hoping at least 20. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling with getting my arms around whether or not this is a reasonable price. I, I know one of the reasons we use architects and put it out for bid is so we get comps 
Uh, I mean, I, I have very limited experience in elevators, uh, but this is well in excess of what we pay at my shop for a three-floor elevator uh, for an upgrade or a modernization. Um, so I'm, I'm, I have no basis to know whether the $88,000 is a, a reasonable number, um, but just one person. Any other comments, questions? So, so as a public school, I mean, you said the, the proposal was 300 plus pages. Are we beholden to different regulations than a, a, a private building? Um, I think to some extent we probably are, but the specifications were really about the engineering pieces themselves. When I say the large is part of the architect engineering fee was for engineering, it was that modernization about replacing the panels and being very specific, and I'm not an engineer in any way, shape, or form. Um, but that is what, why the specs themselves were complicated. It was changing out kind of the guts of those electrical panels and what we needed to do. And, and, and playing devil's advocate from Perkins and Will to put a whole new elevator in and not renovate something is significantly more? Yeah, that's really a lot. Well, I mean, we have the shaft. I'm just, just curious. The electronics. Are, yeah. it's, it, it sounds like we're getting a new better, elevator electronically. Better, better to repair than to replace. And maybe I had asked you before the meeting uh, about whether, since we o we're only able to get one bid this year, if maybe if we waited a year, if we could get more bids, and you felt that that was unlikely, maybe you could share that. Yeah, really by, based on the information that I received regarding the scope of the position, the s scope of the project. Um, our project's not going to get any bigger. It's going to be the exact same project a year from now, which we would pay for escalation. Obviously, the cost of things go up over time. Uh, we, when we publicly bid this, it goes out not only just on a regular public bid, but it also goes out on websites for public works pro projects. So if I was a carpet vendor or if I am, am an elevator company, I'm looking at those public sites. They're not trolling necessarily our specific site, but they're looking to see what's out there for the scope of work with one elevator with not an overly complicated, I mean, I think it's complicated, but compared to a bank of 20 elevators that a municipality or a large scale pl place might be doing, this is a small project in that world. We're not likely to get, you know, a, a big number of bidders. Hmm. Questions? Okay. Have a roll call vote, please. Dr. Nemigas. And I just want to clarify, Perkins and Wills feel that this is a reasonable and prudent cost to the elevator? Because I, I, I agree with Reese. I mean, I, I, my vote will be aye, but I'm, I, my hesitation is I have no basis to, to, to not, and if it's a needed thing, then so be it. It was actually estimated when we put it on the capital project list in 2015-16 at 110000 So it actually, I mean, that's where it was a, you know, roughly pegged at the time. This came in fairly close to that when you look at the original um, when you look at the original pieces of this project, um, that actually came in at 107,731. So really close to where we had kind of pegged it. Um, that was an in, you know that was a number that we worked on with the engineers at the time. Great. So I, I, I'll vote aye. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. Aye. Ms. Davis. Aye. Mrs. Carling. Aye. I don't want the elevator to fall down. <laughs> Mr. Markison. No. Mr. Lane. Aye. Mr. Mormon. Aye. Motion carries. Next up is approval of a textbook purchase in the amount of 120800 per policy 2 colon 20. May I have a motion to approve the text, textbook purchase? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the textbook purchase in the amount of $120,800 per policy 2 colon 20. Second. Second. Any comments, questions? Discussion. I was happy to see that there are um, online uh, subscriptions as part of it, which just feels critical. Vote. Mr. Mormon. Aye. Ms. Davis. Aye. Dr. Nemicus. Aye. Mr. Lane. Aye. Dr. Elliott. Aye. Mr. Markison. Aye. Mrs. Carling. Aye. Motion carries. Next up is. Uh, an adoption of an IMRF resolution. Can someone explain why we're doing this, why we have a need? Uh, 
Um, in March, District 115 was selected for a routine IMRF audit. IMRF is the pension system for all non-certified employees. So if you work over 600 hours in a calendar year and you're not a teacher, you're going to be an IMRF. So it's a routine audit. They have a list of requests for us, and they go through and audit our records. In auditing our records, they determine that there's a $2,500 FBA that is related to insurance that we pay to a group of an What's an FBA? Explain. Fringe Say benefit what allowance. So it's a cash payment that is paid that can be applied towards their insurance contributions. Should they not take insurance, they still get the $2,500 fringe benefit allowance. So there's a group of employees, non-certified employees that were hired prior to 3-1-12 that receive this fringe benefit allowance. Since we pay this and it's related to health insurance, we are asked to pass this new resolution. So IMRF has a board of trustees similar to this board of education that oversees. In December of 2017, they said, you know, we want a resolution adopted by each district that does such a thing like this and municipalities. Transparency. Do people know this is happening, et cetera. So the audit finding was you need to pass this resolution if you continue to pay the $2,500 FBA. So that's what's on here. Very helpful. So may I have a motion to adopt the IMRF resolution? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education adopt the IMRF resolution. Second. Second. Any questions for Brittany or anybody? None? Okay. May I have a roll call vote, please? Mrs. Carling? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Mr. Markison? Aye. Dr. Elliott? Aye. Dr. Nemicus? Aye. Mr. Lane? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the 2018-2019 Board of Education meeting dates? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the 2018-2019 Board of Education meeting dates. Second. 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 Any comments, discussion? There were some questions about Mondays versus Tuesdays. We, we generally are trying to meet on Mondays. I, I, I thought was, Diane had a question, and, and, and I was just I received the answer, and my question I had is I thought we moved to a, um, a, a secular approach to dates, and, and one of the dates we're accommodating is to accommodate a holiday, correct? All three. So I, I'm just, from a matter of consistency with what we did with the, the calendar for the school in the, in the coming year, I, I just wanted to, I feel like we should probably be consistent with, with that rather than inconsistent. Good point. How does everyone else? I agree. I, I would I would chime in and and ask the board on uh, to think about this. While we have um, while we have uh, we're uh, accommodating uh, dates while we are in school uh, board meeting dates um, uh, we're moving. There are dates on which uh, we are not going to have um, a board meeting that uh, would be related to uh, some. Uh, some religious holidays in uh, in one faith or another. For example, we're not going to have uh, any meeting of any kind ever on Christmas. And so, uh, while we are in school on those days, I think that uh, the board meeting, um, uh, if those are uh, if those are dates that uh, we can accommodate, um, I would suggest that uh, either we table this or um, uh, try to avoid those dates. Uh, for significant uh, religious holidays that we're aware of going forward. We were trying to get the dates on Tuesdays, just or on Mondays, just so we could get as many of the seven of us as possible. So we've got three, three Mondays. Yeah, the, the uh, October date is, um, uh, one of the dates is uh, Rosh Hashanah, I believe. Yeah. Another one is um, Columbus Day, and the other, is uh, Hanukkah on December 10th, Monday, December 10th. Are we in school on Columbus Day? No. So what does everybody think? We can talk openly before we uh, you want to table this, you want to vote on it, you want to... I think we should table it because I think Tom brings up a very good point of our religion neutral policy, but I think we need to be... Con uh, considerate of other people's 
holiday. So maybe we should table it and have a discussion as a board and get back okay. to it. Okay. The only thing I'd just like to check, do we have, I, I forget the rules and the time frame. We're okay tabling time-wise to posting meetings, et cetera. There's no run into those requirements. Okay. I just know that we published and yeah, we got inadvertently back ourselves into a corner. So okay. Okay. Tabled. Next up is approval of an, <coughs> excuse me, honorable dismissal of a part-time non-tenured teacher. May I have a motion? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the honorable dismissal of part-time non-tenured teacher. Second. Someone want to explain this uh, from the staff, what we're doing here? Good evening. So based upon staffing um, that is based upon student enrollment and course selection, it has been determined that the FTE is not needed for course selection. Therefore, this is an honorable dismissal, which is resulting in a re reduction in force, which is a RIF. Correct. So may I have a motion? to approve the honorable dismissal of the part-time non-tenured teacher. You have a motion and a second. Yeah. Mr. Markison? Aye. Dr. Elliott? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Dr. Nemicus? Aye. Mr. Lane? Aye. Mrs. Kryling? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, Rebecca, would you mind Getting up, uh, next up is approval of the honorable dismissal, honorable dismissal and reassignment of a teacher. Uh, so I'll do the same thing, and I won't forget this time. May I have a motion to approve the honorable dismissal and reassignment of a teacher? It's um, the exact same rationale, um, just a different faculty member, and it is due to course enrollment and student selection. Therefore, the FTE is not required to fulfill uh, the need for students at this time, so we're rec recommending a reduction in force based upon a sequence of dismissal, which is honorable. Uh, I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the honorable dismissal and reassignment of teacher. Second. 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 Any comments, discussion? So, so uh, I, I find this one extremely challenging, but, but I, I find my role on the board is, is that uh, we have to respect the process of the administration and, and the process has been validated and uh, you know, our role is, is more oversight rather than the getting into the, the, the granular details of, about this. So I have uh, very, very mixed feelings uh, toward this, and, and my vote will represent what I think is my duty to the community uh, in this instance. I appreciate that. Thank you, Tom. We spent a lot of time talking about this in closed session since it does relate to uh, an employee and staffing. Um, so this isn't taken lightly. So may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Davis? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mr. Lane? Aye. Mrs. Carling? Aye. Dr. Elliott? Aye. Mr. Markison? No. Dr. Nemicus? Aye. Motion carries. Next up is approval of our new math instructional director to a one-year contract. May I have a motion to approve the math instructional director one-year contract? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the math instructional director one-year contract. Thank you. Second? Second. Any comments or discussion? Looks like a good hire, Shayla. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Dr. Elliott? Aye. Mr. Markison? Aye. Dr. Nemicus? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mrs. Kryling? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Mr. Lane? Aye. Motion carries. Next up is approval of uh, the HR report. <coughs> HR report as presented. A um, lot of stuff on there just because of the time of the year. Um, so may I have a motion to approve the human resources report? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the human resources report 
as presented. Thank you. Second? Second. Any questions, comments on anything? No? Okay. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Dr. Elliott? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Dr. Nemicus? Aye. Mr. Lane? Aye. Mrs. Carling? Aye. Mr. Markison? Aye. Motion carries. Next are consent agenda items. Uh, I'll remind our board uh, any item can be removed at the request of any board member. So may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items, including the approval of disbursements, payrolls, and financial statements for February 2018, approval of release of executive session minutes for September 11, 2017 to February 12, 2018, minutes of a regular meeting and a workshop for March 12, 2018, minutes of an executive session from the same date, minutes of a board workshop, <coughs> executive session from March 13th, and disposal of audio recordings from April 11, 2016. I move. I move I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the consent agenda items as presented. Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Markison? Aye. Dr. Nemicus? Aye. Mrs. Kryling? Aye. Dr. Elliott? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mr. Lane? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Motion carries. We have two FOIA requests this past month, and they're both complete one from the Illinois Retired Teachers Association and one from Deltec. Some announcements. As Drew mentioned, he gets to sleep till noon tomorrow. Tomorrow is our PSAT freshman and sophomore testing and our SAT testing for juniors, no school for seniors. The percussion festival is tomorrow evening at the RMA at 7 p.m. Friday, April 20th, uh, also as Drew mentioned, Drew, Drew should have read these, is our Alumni Wall of Fame uh, presentation and not 9.45 in the morning. Uh, April 26th to 28th is the spring, spring play, Beauty and the Beast, uh, 7 p.m. at RMA. May 7th through May 14th is AP testing. Fun time, students currently, in, for all students currently enrolled in AP courses. Saturday, May 12th is prom. Uh, Monday, May 14th is our next Board of Education meeting right here, 7 p.m. So. May I have a motion to adjourn the Lake Forest Community High School Board meeting? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is that about it? It's about a week. Oh. Final?